All right, next we have Brandon Jett, and uh, he's going, what are you going to do? He's going to be doing a poem for us. Okay, so I guess the first poem I'm going to do, so I don't get sodomized by Matt, is um, <laughs> my donut poem. Oh, wow. that's unpleasant. Shut up. Wow. My, my donut poem. And <laughs> The backstory to this one is basically uh, a week ago at Tim Hortons, I got a donut and had a sad face on it. And so this is about that donut. It suited you. <clears throat> the donut sorrow, which frown, tears, white, creamy despair. It looks at me crying, begging, bleeding, please kill me. In the suffering, blot out this miserable, God forsaken, doughy existence. Please, please eat me, enjoy me, rejoice in my sorrow, and save me through death. It was delicious. <laughs> And uh, the next poem is called A Dinner at Burger King. And the backstory of this one is basically um, Glenn and I had gone to Burger King the other day and he ordered three sandwiches and only ate two. Okay. My two comrades, my two friends, my two brothers, they mean everything to me. The three of us, we've been through so much. Sorrow, joy, feast, famine, rain, sunshine, heaven and hell. We are, were, inseparable, one flesh, bound by heart, soul, and mind. Until that fateful, dreadful evening, we were plainly adorned with naught but mustard. No ketchup, no pickles, only mustard. As bland as this is, we felt safe, secure, wrapped in a blanket of peace. But this was wrong. The demon began to bite and chew and rip, and the demon, my end. My first friend, my brother, and devoured my first friend, my brother. The screams of agony, of fear, dread, and reject fell on dead ears until he was gone in but an instant. My other comrade, being next, faced the same fate. Finally, it was my turn, but the beast stopped. I was spared in body, but not in mind and soul. No, these I lost when my brothers were torn apart, devoured. Worst of all, this beast regret. The foul demon who moaned that he was sad, upset, regretful, that he could not, would not finish me yet. Okay. And um, last night I was told I have a an obsession with redheads, and so I was told to write a poem, kind of explaining why. And I couldn't remember. You need a reason? You know, a reason? <laughs> no, it, it it stems back to a dream I had several years. I figured this out. I had an epiphany today after a nap that I took as Zach watched me sleep. So <laughs> you're a lot of men watching. <laughs> And so, this one is called uh, Dream Girl, and okay, here it goes. It's seductive and entrancing, as beautiful and mysterious and entrancing as a bright, shining, full moon, unobstructed and unmolested by blemish or by clouds, is your pale, or your pure, white porcelain skin, which traps me, ensnares me, captures and holds me, guaranteeing that I cannot, I will not be able to escape. Not only your snow white skin, but your enticing, seductive, burning, crimson hair, which has etched itself onto my mind, which I cannot forget about, I cannot stop thinking about. I cannot get away from that beautiful, majestic, fiery river, which is your hair. Why does your pale skin, unmolested, untouched by the sun, your blazing inferno of hair intoxicate me, seduce me, drive me mad with passion? Why am I drawn to you with your scarlet locks like an insect to light? Why can I not resist that cream that is your skin? How have I been trapped by your elegance and your beauty when we've still yet to meet on this side of reality? And then um, the very last... The last one I'm going to do is called uh, Translations Futility. And this one stems because of a conversation <coughs> in Manuel's class yesterday. We kind of talked about how Jay Rubin sucks uh, yeah. with the Wind Up Bird Chronicle. And um, it kind of stems from some lit theory a couple years back, too. 
but uh, anyway, here goes. So, I speak, you speak, he speaks, she speaks. It doesn't matter how much do we understand, what can we comprehend, how twisted and perverse are our feelings portrayed, not only through words on the page or spoken, hanging in the air, but even our very thoughts, our innermost beliefs and expressions, the very way in which we view ourselves. These each and all are twisted, corrupt, inadequate expressions of ourselves because our words, our language, the very essence of how we define ourselves, our very thought process is not to us is not us, cannot represent us or adequately express us because these words, this language is not my language or your language, which means that this reality constructed by so, so much by language, by our words, is not my reality, your reality, our reality but a fabricated, imaginary farce of a reality, of a world of an existence. Words captivate us, bind us, cage us, entrance and bury us, fool us into believing, into wanting to believe, to accept that they are everything, the ultimate truth, the force which binds us, rules us, drives us, and we believe our emotions, ourselves, are our words, and allow the words of others to wound us, bite us, sting, and ultimately kill us, even when the fatal words were simply mistranslated, miscommunicated, misunderstood. These words, our language, the linguistic construction of society, culture, countries, the world, the universe, and even ourselves is just that, a construction, wholly, utterly, completely, and totally meaningless because words cannot express, cannot communicate ourselves or the truth of our world, our reality, or anything. There is no truth in words. Even these words are not but a pointless, meaningless, fabricated, failed attempt at a perverse truth which in the end is not the truth but a lie another false reality all right and Stephen Lynch is up next I'm going to read from Murakami Haruki's A Wild Sheep Chase and possibly some poetry after that. I waited for the compressed air hiss of the elevator doors shutting behind me before closing my eyes. Then, gathering up the pieces of my mind, I started off on the 16 steps down the hall to my apartment door. Eyes closed, exactly 16 steps. No more, no less. My head blinked from the whiskey, my mouth reeking from cigarettes. Drunk as I get, I can walk these 16 steps straight as a ruled line, the fruit of many years of pointless self-discipline. Whenever drunk, I throw back my shoulders, straighten my spine, hold my head up, and draw a deep lungful of the cool morning air in the concrete hallway. Then I'd close my eyes and walk 16 steps straight through the whiskey fog. Within the bounds of that 16-step world, I bear the title of most courteous of drunks, a simple achievement. One has only to accept the fact of being drunk at face value. No ifs, ands, or buts. Only the statement, I am drunk, plain and simple. That's all it takes for me to become the most courteous drunk, the earliest to rise, the last boxcar over the bridge. Five, six, seven. Stopping on the eighth step, I opened my eyes and took a deep breath. A slight humming in my ears, like a sea breeze whistling through a rusty wire screen. Come to think of it, when was the last time I was at the beach? Let's see, July 24th, 6.30 a.m. Ideal time of the year for the beach, ideal time of the day. The beach still unspoiled by people, seabird tracks scattered around the surf's edge like pine needles after a brisk wind. The beach. Hmm. I began walking again. Forget the beach. All that's ages past. On the 16th step, I halted, opened my eyes, and found myself planted square in front of my doorknob, as always. Taking two days' worth of newspapers and two envelopes from the mailbox, I tucked the lawn under my arm. Then I fished my keys out of the recesses of my pocket and leaned forward, forehead against the icy iron door. From somewhere behind my ears, a click. Me, a wad of cotton soaked through with alcohol, with only a modicum of control of my senses. Just great. The door may be one-third open. I slid my body in, shutting the door behind me. The entry was dead silent, more silent than it ought to be. That's when I noticed the red pumps at my feet. Red pumps I've seen before. 
parked in between, in between my mud kicked tennis shoes and a pair of cheap beach sandals, like some out of season Christmas present. A silence hovered over them, fine as dust. She was slumped over the kitchen table, forehead on her arms, profile hidden by straight black hair. A patch of untanned white neckline showed between the strands of hair to the open sleeves of her, of her print dress, one I'd never seen before, a glimpse of a brassiere strap. I removed my jacket, undid my black tie, took off my watch, and with not a flinch from her the whole while. Looking at her back called up memories, memories of times before I'd met her, 